Thank you. Are there many people still in lunch? Or is this just not a topic that's grabbing people? It seems a little quiet in here, doesn't it? Whatever. Um, can, can you hear me okay? All right. Uh, just out of interest before we start, um, put your hand up if Python 3 is your primary development language. What's that? Two, and how many for Python 2? Interesting. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, uh, all right. Okay, so as just mentioned, I'm Andrew Stewart. I'm from Melbourne. Uh, I do Python development. I'm a contributor to the Mailman 3 project, um, for which I wrote the authenticating proxy server. And um, uh, the stuff that's in this presentation is largely derived from the work that I did on uh, the Mailman 3 authenticating proxy server. So uh, I have some questions for the audience. Um, who here has heard of Swagger? Uh, okay. And how many have heard of Falcon? Yeah, a small number have heard of Falcon. And how many people have written a REST backend? A substantial number, okay. And um, uh, interfaced to a REST backend? Probably everyone. Yeah, fair enough, okay. All right. Um, so, uh, to give you an understanding of, of where this has come from, um, I worked on a project uh, about a year ago called Single Page Guru uh, with a friend of mine, and uh, I developed the Python back end, and he developed the JavaScript front end, um, and the API was kind of evolving as it went, um, and it was uh, fairly poorly defined along the way, and that led to a lot of frustration, bugs, and uh, wasted time. So my friend and uh, I uh, had a few tense moments as uh, we had to deal with the fact that he kept on having questions about the API, which seemed to be changing, and it wasn't clear exactly what was in the API and how it was working. It wasn't clear to him, it wasn't clear to me what was in the API that I was... Um, so when the next project came along that I wanted to work on, which was Mailman 3, um, I had a look at Mailman 3, and Mailman 3 has a REST API at the back end, but the REST API is only intended to be used internally. It's not meant for um, client browsers to attach to, it's meant for um, other servers to attach to. So I wanted to do some client-oriented development talking to the Mailman REST API. So in order to do that, I thought, well, the first thing I have to do is write an authenticating proxy server. So write an API proxy server that can sit in front of the mail REST API. And I thought, well, I'm damned if I'm going back into the undefined API hell that I had on Single Page Guru. I thought the, the place that I need to start is to, um, is to document the API such that I know exactly what's going on. Um, and I had heard of a tool called Swagger, and it looked like a great tool for the job for documenting a REST API. Um, so without, without documentation of your REST API, uh, you know, you're in the dark. Um, if you've got documentation of your REST API, then you're going to save the time of developers, testers, and BAs who are all trying to find how the API works. If you've worked on a REST project that uses a REST API at all, yes, go on. Oh, is it? Right. Um, G'day. <laughs> um, So if, when you work on, a, on any project that involves a REST API, it's really critical to understand what's in it and how does it work and what are the available uh, routes and methods available on those routes. If you don't have that, well, where does the information come from? I don't know. You have to go and every time you want to do something with the API, you have to go and dig the information out of um, documentation or source or whatever. So it's a nightmare. So you really, if you want to be effective, you need to document your REST API. And once you document it, it becomes the central point of authority for, um, uh, for the project. Um, if you document a REST API into uh, a JSON document, then you can use that to create clients. 
you can use that JSON API doc to create servers, and you can also use it to create tests. So the old way of building a REST API is you would build the routes directly into the code. So if you've got a, you know, a Flask application or whatever, then you start off by having a route defined, and then underneath that you've got a function that responds to the route. So that's the old way of doing it, in which you build that route directly into the code. Um, if you've got the, the, the route inside a JSON document, you've got the opportunity to programmatically use that for a whole range of purposes. Um, so Swagger. Um, Swagger is uh, a specification designed specifically for documenting REST APIs, and it can work in uh, one of two primary ways. Uh, most people seem to use Swagger to automatically, dynamically pull REST uh, API documentation out of code. So they kind of build the documentation into the code. Uh, and that seems to me pretty um, complex and problematic. Um, I took the alternative approach, which is that you just define your REST API in a JSON, a static JSON document. Um, and that takes a lot of the complexity out of the equation. And Swagger seems to have the market momentum, so that's the one that I went with. So the first part of my task in working with uh, Mailman was to document the Mailman API in Swagger. Um, mail, the Mailman API is documented well, but the documentation was all over the place. It was in uh, written documents, it was in the source code, um, and it was a big exercise to go through all of the documentation, find each route, find the uh, structure of the route and put it into uh, the Swagger document. Um, it took me a few months part-time to get it done, but once it was done, the development could start. And um, once you've got your REST API into a Swagger document, then you get to, uh, to look at your REST API via the Swagger um, REST API browser. That they, that they provide. And I'll give you a look at this live. I've got a couple of screenshots, but uh, we'll go to it live. Can you read that? Yeah. Um, so if we open this out, you can see that in the Mailman REST API, there's a category of uh, routes um, that are the addresses, and Swagger documents um, the available methods, so you can see on the left in the various colours the methods that are available, the structure of the route, the parameters that are within the route. Um, and when I looked at this, I thought, fantastic, this makes it extremely clear to anyone who's going to be working on this what routes are available and how to get access to them and how to use them. You can dig further into a given uh, into a given route, and it will give you, uh, you can also document the parameters uh, for that route, and depending on the type of route that you've defined using the Swagger API browser, you can actually put in calls to that, uh, to that route as well. So Swagger's uh, a very effective way to actually do that documentation. But just having a look at the structure of um, uh, a Swagger API document, I won't go into great technical detail because there's an awful lot of uh, info there, but the main things to take note of is that within the Swagger doc, um, you identify the paths in your API. Um, and the other thing to take note of, so you can see at the top there we've got a slash users route, and then the next thing down is that we identify the methods available on that route. And the other critical thing to notice is that Swagger provides the ability to give a route and a method a particular operation ID. And this is the central concept to um, the stuff that I'm talking about here, because it means that you've got a unique way of identifying the combination of the route and the methods available for calling that route. And we'll come back to that. Still listening? All right. um, 
I'm using Windows 10 here, which I installed a, a day or two ago, and I've got <laughs> no idea what it's doing here. <laughs> Unplug what USB we do have plugged in. Okay, so Falcon. Um, Falcon is a Python web server. Um, I was introduced to it again through the Mailman project because Mailman uses Falcon as its um, as the web server for its back-end REST API. So I thought I'll use the same technology. When I got in there and had a look at it, I found that I really liked it. Um, it's, it's got a really minimalist philosophy. And what I mean by that is that it is designed primarily for building REST APIs. And if you look at other Python um, web application servers like Flask or whatever, or you know, Django to the extent that that's a, a web application server, um, they've got a whole bunch of other stuff in there um, that is just not needed if all you're doing is building a REST API. So the good thing about Falcon is that it doesn't have all that um, extra info, I guess, that, make, that uh, complicates things if all you, all you want to do is get a REST API built. Um, and it's quite fast if you care about that sort of thing. Um, here's a chart that I grabbed from some random site on the internet that seems to indicate that Falcon is the fastest of the Python um, web servers by quite a bit. They're suggesting there that it's for whatever test they're doing, which is to return a JSON document, you're getting 20,000 requests a second. I don't know. I don't care so much about the performance. Um, I'm primarily interested in the fact that it's easy to program. And I thought some people might like this. Some people care about performance. Um, OK, so once you've written all these routes into your um, JSON document and you've spent however long doing it, digging through the source code, digging through the documentation, plugging it all into the, the JSON, going through that tedious process, um, the thing that occurred to me is, well, why would I go and hard code all those routes then into the source code of the application that I need to build? I've already stuck them into the JSON. Why do I need to re... You know, what do they say? Don't repeat yourself. Why do I need to go and repeat myself by writing all of the routes back into the code? So I thought what I'll do, I'll programmatically pull all the uh, routes out of the uh, Swagger JSON document and then within Python, I'll map the, my Python functions to the routes. So if you remember, the, I pointed out the operation ID, Swagger documents, um, they have a route, they then have the methods available for that route and you can give each individual method a unique operation ID. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to say, OK, for the combination of a route and a method, so for example, users get, we'll give that a unique ID, and then we're going to connect that up with a Python function. And thus, you get an instant REST API. Um, so just to show you how easy this all is once you tie it together, I'll show you a, uh, um, a, a quick demo, or a, not even a demo, I'll just give you a quick tour of some of the code of, of how this works. I can remember how we switch tasks in Windows. I'm a Mac person at home. I don't know. Okay, so what I've done, I've, I've extracted the code from the Mailman project into a very um, small, I suppose you'd call it a, a library, that allows you to um, take a Swagger document and very rapidly connect it up into a, into a working API. So I've got a couple of example um, functions here. You can see um, uh, g uh, Oh, let me take a step back. If you go to the, uh, to the Swagger website, they've got uh, a sample REST API up there called Pet Store. And what I've done is I've built uh, an API here that implements um, all of the functionality of the Pet Store within 57 lines of code. So we've got... These are um, request handlers. Each of these functions is a request handler. So we've got a small number of request handlers. And what we do here is we 
just provide a dictionary called Operation Handlers. And the Operation Handlers dictionary connects up the operation IDs that I drew your attention to earlier to Python functions. So when a request comes in from the client, um, it'll be matched up to the appropriate operation ID and then sent to the Python function. And then finally, those uh, few lines of code set up the server and uh, set up the Falcon server and, and run it. And that is, that's a complete implementation of a REST API server based on a Swagger document. Um, so as you can see, there's not much code in there at all. Um, obviously, I, I haven't implemented every function, but the one thing to pay particular attention to here is within the operation handlers, so if that's the operation ID, we've got the, oper we've got the opportunity to pass each, each inbound request gets passed not just to one uh, Python function, but we actually pass it through um, as many functions as you want to provide. So, and that gives you the chance to do some tricky stuff for example, here, um, when a request comes in, we first pass it to the JSON web token validation. Um, and if that passes, we then pass it into another function that refreshes the JSON web token. Um, and if it passes that, it then gets passed to a couple of authorization functions that check to make sure that the user who's requesting this has the appropriate level of access. And assuming it gets through all of those functions, then it executes the final, um, the final function. And this indicates how easy it is to um, chain together um, uh, the response, or rather chain together the request handlers that a response, that a request is passed through when it comes into the server. And that's it. So what I wanted to bring across is the idea that a REST API is worth documenting. Uh, an effective way to document it is in JSON using the Swagger specification. Once you've got it into JSON format, that becomes the authoritative um, uh, source of information that defines your methods, requests, parameters, <coughs> etc. cetera. Um, and it is then possible to uh, programmatically connect up your JSON REST, uh, your JSON um, Swagger document um, into a very easy to implement um, Python application server. Okay. Any questions? Any questions, guys? Yeah. Sorry, I, just <laughs> Sorry, I um, might have come in after you um, talked through it, but um, how, do, how does this all uh, sort of plug into um, authentication? Like, it's it's um, a lot. Of, a lot of the time, you see examples of like, here's building a REST API. It's wonderful, but then it's available to everybody. So, um, how, how what's the sort of the next steps in in securing this and making it sort of uh, authentication, authorization? Um, there's a lot of ways that you can do authentication and authorization, and they can get complex pretty quickly. And I've had a look at a lot of them and wasted a lot of time trying to grasp how a lot of them work and implementing them. And um, uh, the one that made sense to me in the end is JSON Web Token, JWT. Are you familiar with JWT? Um, JSON Web Token. Uh, is a very easy way to implement um, uh, authentication. And I think it's really sort of uh, becoming probably the predominant way that people are doing it these days. The core of the way it works is that um, uh, a bit of information is encoded into some JSON and signed by the backend. The backend send it to the client. 
and then the client, each time uh, it wants to request something, sends it back to the server. And the server checks the signature and says, well, is this the information that I sent you? And if it is, it responds. And that's really straightforward, I think. The, uh, I mean, most authentication schemes take a lot more explaining than that, but that's really what JSON Web Token boils down to. The server says, here's some info, I'm going to sign it, and you need to give it back to me with the correct signature. And um, I implemented uh, JSON Web Token here. So all you need to do, um, and that's see where I've got jwt.validate. So in the solution that I've got here, if you wanted to put um, authentication onto every route, then you would just start off every uh, route with jwt.validate. So the very first thing that happens when a request comes in is that it gets piped into jwt.validate. jwt.validate checks the um, JSON web token, and if the web token is good, then it passes it on to the next function, which is JWT refresh. And what that would do is it would refresh the token and, and update it. Um, and the next step is authorization. So authentication and authorization are some two different things, of course. Um, uh, Authorization is the task of saying, okay, well, authentication is the task of saying, who is this user? Authorization is the task of saying, well, um, is this user, now that we've identified the user, are they allowed to get access to the resource that they've asked for? So, just here, this is authorization, requires manager and requires admin. So, the inbound request has been funneled through the JWT validation. It's been funneled through the uh, refresh. It now gets funneled through the authorization to check, well, OK, is this user a manager um, or are they an admin? And if they are, then it says, OK, good. We've, we'll now funnel it onto the next Python function, which is actually doing the job of executing the find pets by status. Does that answer your question? Is there another question? Could Swaka be any useful in a classical microservice architecture? We've got a few microservices, each having one, maybe maximum two endpoints, but they all independent of each other. Uh, yeah, yes, I think yes is the, the short answer. Um, so in that context, you would have a REST uh, API, because obviously the REST API is going to be unified, isn't it? That's not going to... Um, the, the, the microservice architecture is, is going to be behind the scenes effectively, isn't it? The client is not going to be aware that they're talking to a um, microservices architecture. Um, and what you would do with this, and indeed um, what I've done, is that the, um, when, the when the request comes in, uh, it goes to the route, it goes to the operation, and then this function here, your target Python function, just proxies it off to whatever your backend is. So instead of providing individual function, Python functions that actually do the task, for example, of uh, getting inventory or uploading a file, all you do is you proxy it off to whatever backend microservice you want to do the job, and then the response comes back in here and it gets sent back. So effectively, uh, it turns this into a proxy server with microservices behind it, and that would work fine. Are there any other questions? No. Okay, well, thanks okay. very much for coming along. <laughs>